Uh, I apologize for taking a little long to get this thing going, but finally it's working. Um, So are you guys all excited about the iPhone 6 and iWatch? No. No? Oh. I am. Um, Samsung? Samsung? Okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, so um, we started uh, this example on last Thursday and uh, because it's a long example, so we stopped it. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue on this example and uh, uh, we're going to finish up and hopefully I have the time to give you another example today okay alright so again a quick uh, review so it's a, a beam with two-dimensional loading you have a uh, distributed load on the surface on the XY plane right and you also have a concentrate load in the XZ plane so you have concentrate pushing it into the wall while you have a distributed load pushing down okay so now the question is asking uh, with all the with all the geometries given first of all um, where is a where is the maximum tensile and compressive bending stress because remember when we said we have an equation right sigma equals to mc divided by i right so when you have a uh, bending moment happening on a beam you have a, a bending stress developed across the thickness of the beam right and it's asking where the maximum tensile and compressive stresses are and uh, uh, quantified it okay all right so let's look at a first now all we are doing is let's see we're using this equation over here okay so this equation tells us when you have a stress in uh, extraction, you have two-dimensional bending, which, in other words, you have two-dimensional bending moment, mz and my, right? And uh, um, the amount of stress, you can just do a uh, um, superposition together, right? So we can look at them individually. We look at this turn individually, and we look at this turn individually, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's why we need to find an m, because y is the distance to distance to the neutral axis which is easy to find half of the thickness of the beam right and the i is a second area moment of inertia it's easy to calculate as well based on the dimension of the beam okay all we don't know is what's the bending moment inside the beam so therefore our first effort will be finding the bending moment of the beam upon the two-dimensional loading okay all right Okay, so first of all, we started with uh, uh, XZ plane, right? In XOZ plane, you have concentrated force of 100 newtons pushing down, and we're trying to find out what's the bending moment over here. So we start with uh, equilibrium, summation FZ is zero, summation MO is zero, try to find, find out the reaction force because it's a cantilever beam, so therefore you have a, uh, a reaction force going upwards, and also you have a reaction bending moment MO, right? Okay, and we find out MO is equal to 800, and we find out FZ is 100 newtons. So we have a shear diagram, and we have a bending moment diagram like this. So we know maximum bending is 800 newton times meter, which at the corner of where it's fixed, which is 0.0. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> The next thing is uh, we want to see the constant or the distributed loading x y plane. So in x y plane, uh, in x y plane, we can draw the same thing. So this is x axis, and this is y axis over here, and we have a distributed load. With a magnitude of 50 uh, newtons uh, per meter. Okay, now again, 
if you take the uh, reaction force over here off you will end up to have one reaction force going upwards RO prime and in the same time you have a bending moment MO prime which is compensated for the bending moment caused by uh, this force over here right okay now when you have a um, distributed load the first thing you do is you try to find out the equivalent load trying to find out the equivalent load over here so this distributed load can be equivalent as a uh, this orange force here right in the center with a magnitude calculated by 15 newton times meter times total length which I believe is 8 so let's say this is force uh, F so F equals to 5 uh, 50 times 8 yes 400 newtons and the location is it right in the center it is right in the center 4 meters on each side okay all right so therefore when we say summation fy is zero now pay attention this time the force is going y direction right positive y or negative y so summation fy is zero then we know our o prime is equal to 400 newtons pushing upwards because this orange is going down right <clears throat> okay and also we have summation mo prime is zero therefore this mo prime is just equal to this force over here times moment on which is half only four okay so 50 times 8 times 4 this is the force this is the moment on therefore that's 1600 Newton times meter okay so once we have that the next thing is we can draw free body diagram and we can find out with uh, what's the maximum uh, bending moment and uh, what's the maximum uh, internal shear force okay so let's see here first of all shear force as a function of uh, uh, x so see here r prime equals to 400 newtons positive right and you have a distributed load of 50 newtons uh, per meter 50 newtons per meter 50 newtons per meter therefore it's going downwards with a slope of negative 50 so we automatically know this is 400 and then it's going downwards like this right because dv divided by dx equals 2q which is negative 50 although I didn't mention about positive or negative on the on the uh, magnitude of the of the distributed load but you see they're all going to negative y so therefore it's negative right so you have a line start at 400 going negative 5 uh, 50 so at the end it's 0 because okay? 50 times a is 400 all right so I guess my handwriting is getting terrible again huh okay. so next one is looking at the bending moment Newton times meter okay so first of all you have a 1600 that's a uh, out of the end right 1600 now we also know um, at the end where there's uh, there's no bending force at all so there's no shear force at all of course it's going to end up at, at zero right so here's a tricky thing remember we said dm over dx equals to v right so all of the it's positive over here and I, I have a number of 1600 newton times meter so 
it should start either at a positive 1600 or negative 1600 right but and also I know the slope is going to be positive because all these V values are positive right okay so that I automatically load I automatically automatically know if I use all the equations it's supposed to start at a negative 1600 why because you have positive slope so therefore you're going to increase through the whole time and then eventually ends at a zero now let's go back to see why it's negative okay see here so um, this force is going to make this beam rotate uh, clockwise, right? So therefore, this MO prime actually is going to be what? Counterclockwise, right? So we know actually it is going to be counterclockwise. Okay, now here's something interesting. If we if we uh, look at one point, any point, for example, over here. If we look at this point, you have a force going up and you have a uh, uh, bending moment going downwards, right? So at this point, you are going to have a force going down and you're going to have a um, bending moment going uh, uh, clockwise to compensate for that, right? Because at that red point, it is going to be under equilibrium so therefore um, the way you can think is say hey this spending moment at this specific point is negative so that's why all these spending moments are, are negative okay but by saying that it doesn't mean in the future uh, when you are taking a quiz or exam uh, if you have a positive over here going down to zero I'm going to uh, deduct some points from you no why not? Which I'll tell you later because we, you can just see from the figure, right? So in other words, if you have a, a bending moment diagram starting from 1600 and then going down to zero, it's okay too, right? Because all we care is absolutely number over here, okay? All right, um, let's see what else I need to mention. Oh, okay. So initially, this curve looks like a parabolic shape, right? So initially it increased very fast and it slowly um, it becomes um, becomes zero. It's because the slope of this M curve is equal to V. Initially V is a big number, so initially the slope is high. Then slowly the slope becomes less and less and less until zero. So you'll see a curve going this way, okay? All right. Okay, so like I mentioned, all we care, all we are doing for this, this uh, shear force and bane moment diagram is we're trying to find these two things. This and this. 800 and 1600 Newton times meter. Okay, all right. Now a quick reminder. this right so probably we already know what's M based on what we did the moment diagram right and uh, uh, like I mentioned C is a distance to the neutral axis which I'll show you it's like right away you can get it another quantity we don't know is I so probably we need to calculate the I huh all right so I Z equals to 1 over 2 so 1 over 12 base times height cubic so base is 0 0.75 height is 1.5 cubic and then that give you, gives you 0 0.2109 meter the fourth okay because so if you look at a cross section of the beam this is our z axis and uh, um, the height over here is 1.5 the base is 
zero point seven five. Okay, now um, the way you okay, the way you calculate uh, the IZ, I mean all the area moment of inertia is always one over twelve base times height. So that tells you height plays more important role, right? Um, so that's very easy to understand physically. Actually, uh, anyone has a ruler here, a plastic one or a stainless steel one, a ruler. You have a ruler? Okay, can I can I borrow that? What? This one? Oh, you have a different one? Traditional shape? Um, oh, you have one? Awesome. Okay, so because it's hard for me to remember, so what I always do is, you know, area bending mo uh, area moment of inertia is just a, a quantity to calculate how easy it is to bend, right? Now imagine this uh, ruler over here. So if I'm going to bend this way, it's easy, right? I can bend it with my hand. So in this case, the base is the width over here, okay? And the height is just the thickness. So the base is big, but the height is so small. So 1 over 12 b times h cubic. This h is a small number because how thick is this ruler? Probably half millimeter, right? And how big is this base? Probably about 1 inch, so about 2 centimeters, right? So 2 centimeters um, times 0.1 centimeters, a small number. So I can bend it. Easy, right? What if I do this way? Pretty much impossible, right? In, you know, I'm, trying, I'm trying to bend it up. So in this case, the base is one millimeters, but the height is two centimeters. So in this case, you have height of two centimeters, two, 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 two times two times two, that's eight. That's a big number, right? Because this time the height is, has a power of cubic. So it's, therefore this uh, area moment initial is a big number. So therefore, under the same bending force I have applied by my hand, I cannot bend it. Make sense? Yes, okay. All right, thank you. All right, so that's the same thing. And uh, for IY, you can calculate in the same fashion. One over two, base times height cubic. One over 12, base. Did I say something wrong or did I break your ruler? No? Okay, all right. So in this case, um, it's the other way. So the base is 1.5, the height is 0 0.75. Okay, now this is IY. This is IZ. All right, so I have another two numbers which will be useful for my calculation. Basically, that tells you this area moment, area moment of inertia is a quantity to measure how easy it is to get a bend under a certain amount of uh, uh, applied moment, right? Okay, let's see. All right. Okay, and uh, um, so uh, one last thing is we need to find out the um, distance to the neutral axis, right? So, okay. that's very easy, and uh, I'm just going to draw a picture over here. To show you under hmm? everything okay? Anything wrong? Or oh, you guys didn't get to write down the notes?
Okay, so this is our beam, right? And this is coordinates. All right, and uh, this is force. Okay, so by looking at it here, actually, let me just turn it. By looking at it here, uh, if we only look at the x, y plane, which has the distribute load over here, so you are going to see load like this. Okay, now still keep in mind the burden or the point O is fixed while the other point C over here is free, right? So it doesn't have any uh, constraint at all. Okay, now you can imagine, um, so under this load, under this distributed load, if I'm just trying to push it down, where is maximum stress at? Uh, where it's mounted? Yes, uh, let me, that's right, that's absolutely right. So, let me give three points. For example, this is point A, this is point B, and this is point C. So, where is the maximum stress at? If I push it down or hit on a, at a which line at a B right should be this line maximum tensile stress right because if you push it down this top is trying to uh, separate away from the wall right and <coughs> Let's say this is point D over here. So where is the maximum compressive stress at? CD, right? Very good. Should be CD over here. Because it's trying to push into the wall, right? Because uh, in the center, at a neutral axis, is nothing, right? Top will be on the tensile, bottom will be on the compression. So of course, the further it is away from the neutral axis, the more stress it'll be, right? Okay, so very good. Um, let's see here. Let me try to draw a, a cross-sectional view for you. I don't want blue. In this case, let's see. This is Y, and uh, let's just take a cross-section, right? So. Because uh, in the dimension of y, the maximum over here is 1.5. 1.5 is from top to bottom. So the maximum distance to the neutral axis should be half of it, which is 0.75 from top to the neutral axis, right? So this is our maximum neutral axis under this loading condition. Make sense, right? Okay. All right. So let's try to see the other case. The other case. I'm not going to draw the um, boundary conditions because everybody already know. Okay. So, um, again, you have this. So, this time, the concentrated force is pushing into the wall, right? And uh, again, I have x axis and y axis. So, in this case, bottom is fixed, right hand surface is free to go. And if you have a force pushing into the wall, into the negative z direction, 
Now, I still say I have a point A, B, C, D. A, B, C, and D. So in this case, on the force that's pushing into the wall, where the maximum positive tensile stress will be at? At BC, right? And how about compressive? Should be 80, right? All right. Okay. Now, uh, let me draw this cross section view. Z and a Y. So, because the length along Z is 0.75, so half of it will be 0 0.375. If I did my math right. Okay. So, um, these two loading conditions, as we mentioned, we can consider them separately, right? Now, um, <clears throat> the question is asking where the maximum stress for both tensile and compression is, right? Both force will cause stress in the tensile and compression. Tensile and compression. And the total effect will be superpositioned, right? They'll be added together. Now, on A, B, C, D, the surface is two points. They are very special. What's the special about? They lie on both red lines for the case of a distributed load and a concentrated load. At the same time, there's another point. It lies on both maximum compressive stress and under the distributed load and also maximum um, compressive load under the concentrated load. So these two points are point B and what? Point D, right? So point B is on the maximum tensile stress of AB due to the uh, distributed load. But point D is under um, uh, is under the uh, maximum compressive stress line on the distributed load. At the same time, they are on the maximum tensile and the compressive loading because of the concentrate load as well. So that tells you very probably, very possible, maximum tensile will be at a point B, maximum compression is at a point D. Use a different color. Compression, I use blue. And uh, tensile, I use red. Make sense, right? Yes? <coughs> Two dimensional loading. Okay. All right. And we also find out the distance to the neutral axis, which is C uh, in the equation, right? So, okay, so let's add these together. <coughs> okay. So let's say maximum tensile stress. Curves at point A. Which is caused by post loadings. which is distributed and concentrated
key. Now, therefore, stress along the x direction at point A. Equals to mz times y divided by iz plus my times z, which is our point A, divided by iy. Okay, um, mz, which is what we calculated, 1600, while a half distance to the to the uh, neutral axis is also what we calculated. Iz we have the number 0 0.2109 plus my 800 times za 0 0.375 iy 0 0.05 273 so equal to 11,380 pascal yes oh I'm sorry yes <laughs> thank you Okay, so it's at a point B, and uh, uh, all you need to do is find the numbers and then just plug them into it, right? Okay, so um, here's one thing I want to mention. Now, for the distributed load, Once you push it down, you are going to have tensile stress on the uh, point B over here, right? Let's see how I'm at A, B, C, D. Okay. Okay, so because due to the distributed load, the tensile stress on A, B should probably go this way agree right okay now if you have a concentrated load trying to push it downwards on the BC point of view only look at BC all right Oh, let me try to use a different color to separate it. Concentrated force. It's going to cause stress going that direction. If I say this is sigma x prime, and uh, this over here is just sigma x double prime. Now, as you would imagine, at the point B, the stress is these two added together, right? Now, both tensile stress is pointing to the positive x direction. That's why answer is sigma x. Okay, <coughs> makes sense, right? And uh, then uh, um, by looking at this uh, stress. Concentrate force in red color, causing stress uh, in red color pointing to positive x. <coughs> this real load uh, has black color, so it, it's causing stress uh, of black color pointing to also positive uh, x direction. So only at a point B, the black and the red add together, right? So that's why it's called a sigma x at a B, because it is pointing to the x direction, and at a point B, it's just equal to the <coughs> Uh, superposition of these two things and like I mentioned see all I care is amount of the 
um, banding, right? So I just use 1600. I don't care about its positive and negative because from this figure, I know both the positive x, so I add them together. And also this my, all I care is the absolute value, 800. And that's what I used, right? And the yb and the zb, of course, they are always positive number because that's a distance, right? And the iz and iy, they are positive numbers. So I think in the textbook, it has a negative number over here because of uh, the definition of the of the bending moment. But I don't really like it because it's getting confusing. Because by looking at the, these figures, both black and the red are pointing to the same direction. Of course, I can just add it, right? So um, I think this is easy, and uh, that's why I didn't really follow the textbook over here. Um, so I think that might be easy to understand. Um, you guys agree? Or not necessary? Okay, sure. Whatever you want, as long as you can get the right answer, okay? All right. Okay, so the next thing will be we want to look at where the maximum compressive stress, right? Okay, compressive stress, it's the same thing. Compressive stress Of course the maximum will be at a uh, line CD over here And then, like I mentioned um, It's going to uh, at Point D it is because where you have concentrated force over here, the maximum uh, compression is at AD. So this D is on the both line, so you can add them together, right? Now, a good thing about this example is everything is symmetric. So neutral axis is right in the center. So actually, I automatically know at point D should equal to negative of point B. That should equal to negative 11 through 80 Pascal, right? Because everything is symmetric, okay? And uh, uh, compressive stress is just nothing but the inverse, I mean, just opposite of uh, uh, tensile stress. So it's just take the negative, that'd be good, okay? All right, so you guys have any questions regarding question A so far? No? Okay. All right, so the next question is, it's asking if the beam is a, a solid circular cross-section With diameter D equals to 1.25 meters. Okay, so same loading condition, but the only thing different is we change that to a circular shape. Okay, all right. Now, um, this. Um, I'm just going to uh, show you the equation we need to use is the maximum uh, stress equal to 32 pi d the cubic my plus mz 1 over 2 okay so this is the equation we need to use and I didn't really mention initially because I figure it's just easy if I Mention that while we see the example, so you can just remember right away. Okay, all right. So thirty-two pi d cubic times eight hundred square plus sixteen hundred square. Sorry, missing a square over here. Square root 
And a D diameter is 1.25. So therefore you plug in the numbers 9329 Pascal. Okay, uh, that's the answer. Now, the reason why I think uh, question B is important is see, compare these two numbers. So, when you have a circular shape, circular shape beam. Tensile is 9329, while compressive is 93, is negative 9329, right? So if, if you look at this um, absolute number here, maximum tensile, we have a rectangular, it's 11380, but if you have a circular shape, it goes down to 9329, right? So that tells you we well, you have a beam, if it's a circular shape under the same loading, probably you're going to see less maximum stress, which means a less chance of failure, right? Okay, so anyways, that's uh, about it for the uh, example. Um, now I'm very positive you will see a very similar question or problems in the quiz and the exam, all right? Um, so make sure you understand this example. We have two dimensional loadings. How do you do that, do the analysis and uh, what's the steps? So make sure we are all uh, fully aware of the, this example, okay? All right. Have any questions so far? Okay. All right. So the next topic I want to cover is called torsion. So torsion is a little different from a bending. Um, it is another type of uh, deformation you'll see a lot in a beam. Yes. Question on the last point you made. Yeah. Does it make a difference that it's circular versus rectangular, or is it a function of the cross section area? In terms of uh, in terms of a what? In terms of the stress that, it, that you develop with the forces that are applied. Is it in terms of the cross section or the terms of the shape? In terms of a cross section. Okay, so that's a heavier cross section than the circular one, right? Um, yes, it is because it has more area under the same uh, dimension. If you uh, um, if you use the same amount of materials, of course, circular will have a, uh, um, a less area, right? Because of uh, circular, ideally, it's maximized for the uh, least um, surface area to volume ratio. So, of course, it is, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. All right, so torsion. So fundamentals of torsion, uh, just a quick review. It's when you have a beam that's fixed at one end, and you set up your coordinates like this, x, z, and y. For example, the end is fixed. Okay, and so end is fixed, and uh, I'm trying to apply a pair of torque. Try to twist it. Total length over here is L. And uh, um, if it if it has a fixed end and it have free end and you have uh, a coordinates like x, y, and z set up over here, total length L 
we're trying to have a torque, pair of torque apply on it, of course it's going to twist it, right? So it's different from bending, you don't see the curvature, but at the same time, you see a, a deformation at the front surface. Because the top and the bottom surface is fully fixed, so you see a twisting on the front surface. Okay. So the way we can quantify it is we looking at the front surface. So y and z. If we say initially. Before the force is applied, you have a point A, and after the uh, torque is applied, it changes to A prime. This angle over here we call it theta. Okay. All right. Now, theta is quantitatively defined by the amount of torque you apply, the length of the beam and a uh, modulus of rigidity and also polar second moment of inertia okay um, so this T over here is torque Newton times meter torque actually is very similar quantity as a uh, moment because they have the same unit Newton times meter right which next example I'm going to show you we have three dimensional loadings some torque and a moment they interchangeable Okay, so L is the length, G is modulus of rigidity. And J is polar second moment of inertia okay so um, it's also easy to understand <clears throat> see the higher the torque you apply of course this amount of uh, change this theta is be, will be higher right now the longer it is the more it will be why because think about this, if this beam is really short, this beam is really short, we apply same amount of torque, it becomes more rigid. It's kind of like when you have a beam, if it's really long, it's not that rigid on this, on the, if you have a concentrated force in the center, right? It's the same idea. And the G is modulus, modulus of a rigidity is very similar to Young's modulus. If this thing is uh, made out of rubber band, easy to bend. If this thing is made out of uh, stainless steel, of course, it's harder to bend, right? So, and the same thing, it's hard to twist. So, another thing is J, which is a function of the geometry. Um, the bigger the diameter it is, of course, it's harder, right? So, um, basically, uh, that's it. And uh, um, here's also another quantity uh, that's interesting. So, if I say on this on this cross section area. I have an arbitrary point with a radius of, of rho and the total radius of this entire cross section is R so this shear stress developed throughout the cross section for a rounded ball in torsion these stresses are 
are proportional to the distance to the center, which I say here is radius r. Oh, sorry, it's radius rho. Is tau equals to t rho divided by j. Okay, so that's also uh, uh, easy to understand. It's very similar like a neutral axis idea. So if I twist it, it, on the outside surface, it has most shear stress. At the rotational center, for example, I say this is 0.0, it's not going to have any shear stress at all. Okay? All right. Tau max equals to T rho max divided by J. In other words, equals to T R divided by J because Maximum row just equal to R on the surface, right? So that tells you on the surface of the rod has a maximum shear stress, but in the center it has zero stress, shear stress wise. Okay. All right. Now that's for circular cross sectional area. You have this. If you have a, a rectangular <clears throat> this is the equation we uh, need to use but I don't think I'm going to have any example requires you to use this use this definition uh, just to let you know, all right? Where are you coming with tau? Hmm? Where are you coming with tau? Tau times t? What is it? Here? Yes. 1.8? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, uh, a quick review. <laughs> Bexler tells you if you have a cantilever beam, you have a torque applied, then shear stress is going to generate it, right? Actually, if you want, I can do this for you. So, torque applied. Torque on top and bottom, I mean, there's a, uh, another torque at the end, but I'm only going to show you the torque in the front, right? So the amount of the shear stress should equal to this. Kind of like uh, how we learned um, the neutral axis concept, right? So if it is right in the center of the rotation, then there's no shear stress. If it is far away on the surface, the stress is the highest. It's linear relation two, right? That's why we have this equation. See the tau. Okay, all right, so that's pretty much it. And uh, um, we have class until until what time? 420, right? Okay, huh? 19 minutes? Okay, I prefer not say this example because it's read to speaking long and I want to be consistent. So, what I'm going to do is on Thursday, I'll give you an example of a talk and a uh, moment combined the loading, okay? So the next 20 minutes, I'm going to show you some new concept, um, which doesn't require a big example. So we can uh, finish things up a little quickly on time. Okay, so another thing is, like I mentioned, in our mechanical design, one of the important component is the beams, right? So when you have load on a beam, Another thing is deflection and stiffness. Okay, so again, we look at a uh, simply supported beam.
So if you have a simple S4 beam, uh, one end is fixed, the other end is free to go, right? Okay, now if I apply a force right in the center, you would imagine it's going to see deflection, right? Imagine this is a piece of wood, and then both ends are fixed. I use my finger to push it down. It's a thin piece of wood, okay? So it's going to deflect like this, right? Okay, so the maximum distance is definitely in the center where the force is applied. But to be general, I say the vertical distance between any arbitrary point to before and after the loading is Y. And the total length over here is L. So on a small force and small deflection, this Y and F, they, are, they have linear relationship, all right? So 10, four, 10 newtons, 10 microns, 100 newtons, 100 microns. So they're linear on a small deflection and a for a relative speaking long beam, okay? All right, in this case, the beam is long. Now, sometimes you may ask me, hey, how do you define the long, right? We're, we're not liberal arts, we're engineers. We like numbers, right? So, long, is L divided by A is bigger than 20. So it tells you when you have a beam, the length divided by the cross-sectional area is more than 20, then you can call it a long beam, okay? If it's less than that, then we call it a short beam, okay? All right. Now, that tells you when you have a long beam, you have a linear relationship between the force supply in the center and a displacement, okay? All right, now also, since we mentioned about long beam, of course we have short beams, right? So when the beam is short, <laughs> still do the same thing, force supply to the center. You will also see displacement across uh, the original and the deformed shape. Right now, in that case, what do you have? So you have a non-linear relationship F Y. So this is for short beam. Now, when it's short beam, usually L divided by A is less than twenty. Okay, so initially, um. The amount of force you apply is relatively speaking easy to have a um, displacement. Now it becomes stiffer and stiffer. That's short beam, all right? So that's a phenomena for short beam. Okay, so um, just be uh, just be aware of those things. Okay, now for most of the case we have here. We only consider linear F and Y relationship. So now because they are linear, therefore one of the quantities we're interested in is this tangent alpha, which equals to F divided by Y. Right? Okay. Because they're linear, this slope is constant across the entire loading conditions. Now when it's constant, tangent alpha is also a constant value. We give it a name, which is k, and the k we all know is called spring constant. 
because they're very similar as spring, right? When you have uh, when you compress a spring, it's going to shrink, and uh, the force that you you applied and displacement they, it's linear, right? Okay, so for any of the beam, it also has spring constant to quantify the amount of force you applied and the vertical displacement you'll have. Okay, all right. So um, the next thing I want to mention is uh, tension. Compression and torsion. Oh, just a quick reminder. Uh, remember, we've said we're going to have uh, three projects, right? So, very possible since we're already in uh, pretty much mid September. So, I am going to assign the first project on Tuesday, right? So, on Tuesday, I will assign you into. 12 groups, we have about 62 students, so 12 groups, each group will have 5 students, or 2 of the groups will have 6 students, because we have 62 students. So, um, and I'm going to give you out the description of first project, so uh, just be aware of that, alright? So, uh, make sure you show up in class if you uh, came on Tuesday, alright? Okay. Alright, so, tension, compression, and torsion. Now again, like I said, um, I will assign the groups randomly, um, and sometimes actually uh, the department will help me to assign the groups. So um, you cannot choose your group members on your own, all right? So uh, you have to work with some people uh, um, I assign you to. Um, I haven't had any case change of group members, uh, which I don't want to do that. Uh, and the reason I already told you, right? Okay, so uh, um, once I assign a group, it's set. You have to stick with the group for the entire semester, okay? All right, so... Did that say local? Huh? Okay, total. Total extension or contraction. Of a uniform ball imputation or compression. Is delta equals to F times L divided by A times E. So this is when you have a beam um, that's under loading. And uh, the force is applied. The maximum displacement is called delta. So F times L divided by A times E. This is what a uh, um, what a uh, yeah the total uh, displacement is defined, and also we know the displacement is in the y direction, right? So we we can also say the delta is y. Okay, so K is a quantity to relate to the force applied and the displacement you have. Right? So therefore, we can define this K equals to AE divided by L, which is very similar to F equals to K times Y, like what we see before, right? F equals to K times Y. So basically, I have F, I keep F over there, and then the delta is just Y, because it's in Y direction displacement, and everything else e is just K, okay? So, in other words, the spring constant of a beam is a function of a cross-section area, it's a function of a Young's mode address, and it's also a function of the length, which makes sense. Why? 
imagine the beam, right? The longer it is, the easier it is, it is to get bent, right? So if it's really long, hang there, you point into the center, the beam, relatively speaking, it's not stiff. So it's easy to get uh, displaced. So the longer it is, the less the spring constant is, right? Young's modulus also makes sense. If it's a wood beam, you can uh, uh, displace it, but just use your hand. But if it's a stainless steel, it's more rigid. So the spring constant is proportional to Young's modulus. And a cross-sectional area for sure, right? If you have a really skinny beam compared to a very uh, big diameter beam, of course, big diameter beam is going to have a higher stiffness, right? Okay. All right. So I am going to stop here because uh, that's pretty much uh, all the stuff I want to cover. Um, Thursday, we'll have an example, okay? All right. See you guys on Thursday.